Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Forestry Graduate Student Association, I welcome you to the first fall forestry lecture. Tonight, speaker is Dr. Frank Wasworth. Dr. Wasworth earned his master's degree from University of Michigan in 1937, working on succession in central Alaska. He then decided, I guess, that Alaska was to call for him to continue for a PhD, so he worked on forest management in the Luquillo Mountains in Puerto Rico while earning a PhD from Michigan as well. He w has worked for the Forest Service for more than 50 years, first in Arizona and since 1942 in the Tropical Forest Experiment Station in Puerto Rico. He was the director of the Institute of the Tropical Forestry for 20 years, and now he holds the position of research forester. He has been involved with teaching graduate level courses in Venezuela, as well as many short courses on tropical forestry in Puerto Rico. He has written about 90 technical articles in forestry, has been in more than 20 international tropical forestry consultancies, and participated in several scientific teams for the United Nations FAO Forestry Commission. Since 1979, he has been the editor of the International Society of Tropical Foresters and is on the editorial board of the New Forest. Tonight, he will be speaking on our role in saving the tropical forest. Please, let's welcome Dr. Watson. Thank you, Edgar. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here. I've never been at Iowa State before. Uh, I used to work in the shelter belt in Nebraska, and since my home was in Chicago at that time, I zigzagged back and forth through here when the corn was knee high. It was a beautiful place to see. Um, the subject is a huge one, and anybody who tries to cover it is doing a lot of things that are in the realm of guesswork and hunches. Um, everybody who's been in the tropics has a different impression, usually from a fragment of knowledge sometimes gained in the city or a cocktail party or somewhere, and so I will try to limit things, my comments, to what I feel most sure of. You're going to see lots of opinion in it. That's really what makes the world go round. Uh, first, I'd like to say that we, and I speak of you, all of us, need a role in saving the tropical forests. I suspect many of you are here because you accept that. Uh, unlike in the temperate zone, most of the soils, the productive soils of the tropics, are forest products. The soil would have been in the sea long since had it not been for forests in the past. Most of the usable water in the tropics is a forest product. Just go to any of the large cities and find out where their water comes from. They go long distances to get to forested areas. Most of the cooking fuel in the tropics comes from forests, and there's no sustainable alternative. In summary, it's the forests that have made the tropics habitable for more than two billion people. And yet, despite this, 40% of the tropical forests have been cleared, and deforestation continues at a rate of 1% a year, more or less. And the losses resulting from this deforestation are no mystery, neither to us nor to the people in the tropics. Soil productivity declines rapidly. The lands are abandoned. Streams and rivers are sedimented. The Rio Cauca in Colombia used to be navigable 60 kilometers up now it's not. There's a railroad been built alongside of it. A decline in the quality of surface water is everywhere. Long pipelines to every city. And if you drink it, you know what I'm talking about. Accentuated flooding, the loss of irrigation, the best lands in the tropics for wood, for, for food. The irrigation systems inundated, lost major food, food source that's hard to recover. Decline in wood accessibility and in quality. 
you want uh, mahogany furniture, you pay. A loss of employment in wood processing. Many countries have already forgotten that this existed. And there are a few places in the tropics where fuel wood is as expensive as food. And experiments are in progress to raise a kind of beans you don't have to cook just to save fuel. As might be expected, we don't read about this, but this leads to human misery. It's a part of the environment that has deteriorated so much that most of the people not only are short of food and other things that we like, but their life is a misery. Women looking for wood for two days, burning uh, substitutes, some of them fertilizer that they would put on their crops. These problems have led in Africa to widespread migrations. Nobody says it's because of a lack of wood, but it's often one of the major causes. The Bedouins in the north part of West Africa receive fuel wood hauled 400 miles because they don't like charcoal. When forests provide your shelter, your food, and your water, you go where they are and you move away from where they aren't. This leads to political strife, and here we come in. Political strife among the governments of the third world, and we know about it now, produces international repercussions, and somehow the United States can't stay out of it. We all may have our opinions as to whether we should or not, but we don't seem to be very good at it, and so it comes home to roost. And this means a complete circle from the loss of the tropical forests to you and me. Thus, saving the tropical forests may mean saving ourselves. The solution of these problems, right at the heart of it, is what we stand for, forestry. A start has been made in tropical forestry. You can read now that there's nothing known about it. Nobody knows how to manage the forest. Nobody's ever done it. We're starting with untrodden snow, so to speak. It's not true. There's more than a century of progress in tropical forestry, most of it in the other hemisphere, and much of it very ingenious. It's involved protection. It's involved reforestation, plantation management, and the management of natural forests. Past production concentrated on luxury timbers for export. I guess we all know why. It was colonial. It was being done for the colonial powers. The British wanted teak. Everybody else wanted mahogany or some other specialist wood from West Africa. And those were the things they tried to produce. And they had troubles. They had troubles because they were very particular about which species they raised. And they learned what they could about them but the forests were full of other things, and they had all kinds of problems with regeneration and growth rates. There are today more forestry schools, as many as 26 in Brazil alone, more government forestry agencies, more institutions of forestry research, more declared forest reserves, and foresters and forestry technicians than ever before. There is also extra-tropical preoccupation with the future of tropical forests, unprecedented by multilateral, bilateral, national, governmental, non-governmental agencies offering millions of dollars in assistance toward this end. The so-called Tropical Forest Action Plan calls for $8 billion between now and the end of the century, supposedly to combat deforestation. Yet, the financial resources in all countries inadequately support protection and management of the forests, or even career opportunities for people like you and me in the field of forestry. Exploitation of the remaining forests continues, generally with no plans or provision to control or protect or assure future forest productivity 
or even survival. Only some 3% of the forests of the tropics are believed to be under a form of management that promises a future cut. Less than 1% of the lands deforested have been replanted. Thus the task looks pretty big. The profession of forestry in the tropics faces problems not all unique to the tropics, but which in scale and complexity dwarf those faced by Pinchot and other leaders in the temperate zone. The forest area six times that of the United States is involved. Forest diversity challenges simple management systems. The Caribbean National Forest in Puerto Rico, the smallest almost, 28,000 acres, has more tree species on it than all of the national forests combined. Exposure by the foresters and the forests to unrestrained pressure for an unsustainable agriculture. This is one of the biggest problems. A lack of coordination with agronomy. Agroforestry in many places is but a word. The agronomists either don't believe in it, they don't understand it, and in no way do they push it. It's us, the foresters. And until agronomy climbs aboard, carries the flag, we're going to have real troubles in getting somewhere in agroforestry. There's need in the tropics for integration between agriculture and forestry. National policies generally disregard the non-financial values of forests. It's not unique to the tropics, but it's crucial because in many places the social values far transcend the financial value of the forest. Then we have something we all know here too, criticism from environmental interests on what foresters do and what is called forestry. There is in the tropics the same confusion we know between preservation and conservation. There is an assumption in the tropics that primary forests can somehow be sustained and still yield timber. There is a consideration of the harvest of mature trees as high grading. There is ridicule of the principle of multiple use as unsafe in the hands of foresters. There is a lack of tranquil flora, fora for exposure of facts and resolution of differences. Some of this is familiar to all of us. Recent research emphasis is on problems of little immediate utility to solve urgent management problems. Global warming, we're worried about it. We're told that in 2030 we're going to feel it, but the people of the tropics won't. They will have lost food, fuel, and their forests. They'll have no water. They won't be there by then. We have to do something first if we're going to give them the pleasures or the uh, lack of pleasure that comes with global warming. Those problems are far more critical. Then we have, as we have here in the United States, deficiencies within the profession in dealing with people instead of trees. An assumption that social and political problems are somebody else's. This is a common comment by foresters in the tropics. This then is the lion's den into which forestry students who may come for part of their education to institutions such as this one are thrown promptly on their return home. Technical challenges abound. If you're interested in the technical side of forestry, the tropics has much to offer. The big need is to prove the forests are valued. I pointed out at the beginning they're terribly valuable. They're crucial to the survival, and yet we have to prove their value. And people put values on them that are not the things that are most important. But is there some wood you can cut out? That's the value that people think of. We must somehow learn to establish these other values in the minds of everybody. We must learn how to work together with multiple uses so that water preserves as many forests 
is timber. My personal belief is that the forests on the flatlands are doomed. They're going into agriculture, whether it's permanent or temporary. It's the forests on the hills that bring water that will be saved, and not because of the timber, but because of the water. We're going to need the water for the people. We've got to marry water and timber in our management. We must learn more about fauna. I came back yesterday from a meeting in Mexico of two weeks, which we studied investigation practices for silviculture. And the resolutions of the group, 25 graduate foresters, said nothing about fauna. And Mexico needs to study its fauna. It needs to control its fauna. Another thing that's come over recently, and people are shouting about it a little bit, is ecotourism. I'm not sure how far it's going to go, how big it's going to be. But it's one of those things that adds a dimension to tropical forests that might get the temperate zone concerned. We are concerned about the giraffes in Africa. Why wouldn't we be concerned by seeing macaws and other animals, monkeys, howlers, in the tropical forest? It's never been tried. You go up a river in a canoe, it's an experience you never forget if you come back. <laughs> One of the things that's a particular interest of mine is secondary forest. Secondary forests, as I define them, and not everybody else does this, are two types. One is the forest has been cut over and never cleared, so it comes up as kind of second growth, as we know it. And the other is the volunteer forest after clearing, burning, grazing, whatever is done to it. The two converge in time. The same species come together because they're the secondary species, and so I have trouble keeping them separate and see no reason to do so. These secondary forests, unlike the primary forests, are not declining in, the, in, in area. Because as the primary forests get cut, you get more secondary forests. And as agriculture abandons more land, you get more secondary forests. So they're, they're holding their own quite well. And they're almost ex in extent as large as the primary forests. In a great many countries, they're the only thing left. And so secondary forest is what the forester should learn to work with and make grow. Secondary forests have been thought of as worthless. They don't have the same species as the primary forests, the old hard timbers that we use for construction, the ones that resist termites and decay. The trees are small, and they're normally thought of as something to cut down and farm. Actually, if one thinks clearly, this is not the picture you see. In the future, we're not going to have mahogany. We're not going to have teak. At least, it's not going to be cheap. And there are a lot of other woods we can use that we're not using, meaning that if you look at the future market, many of the woods we today discard will have a use. And if you go into these secondary forests looking for them as well as the mahoganies, you get a surprise. The birds and bats have been busy, and they're there. We made a survey of the forests of Puerto Rico, some 400,000 hectares, a big area, and found that 50% of the secondary forests in that area, some 100,000, were adequately stocked naturally with species that have a good hope for future markets. Some people laugh at the species we listed because today we don't use them. But we didn't used to use aspen either several other things that are in this vicinity that are now being used. So it's wise to look forward. That plus the fact that these are lighter woods, they're more versatile, we can treat them against uh, decay and insects, and they respond to silvicultural treatment because they, they're light demanders, and we can get faster growth out of them. This suggests that much can be done in the secondary forests. I've seen them in the Amazon, I've seen them in Malaysia, in southern Mexico, in the West Indies, and everywhere these secondary forests are richer than people think. The first generation may be junk, but look beneath it and see who came in as soon as the birds could perch on the things. And you have the second generation coming along. Almost all the species that are useful produce droops. They're natural for 
bird carriage or bats, and they move in quickly. And all they need is liberation. In Malaysia, in Sarawak, north, in the northern half of Borneo, bless them, they liberated a lot of these trees on thousands of hectares. And in other thousands, they located the trees, but they didn't liberate them. It was an experiment, but a huge one, 35,000 hectares in total, which is 70,000 acres or more. And the growth rates four years after cutting of the liberated were significantly more rapid in basal area than those unliberated. And at the eighth year, the disparity between the two had kept on separating. They were still accelerating in growth. And to go out and see these was a great pleasure because the liberated trees were in the crown, in the canopy already, beautiful big crowns going up. They needed no more help until harvest. And in the others, you had this very dense situation with no release. And we figured out that by releasing, we could reduce the cycle, the cutting cycle, by 10 years. And that's much more meaningful than saying they grew faster. Even economists understand that, because the country has got to come back for timber. And they were on a 25-year cycle, which was wrong. They should have been on a 45-year cycle. But with liberation, they can bring it down to 35 years, which means a great deal economically to the country. Productivity of these forests can be accelerated by a simple process of liberation in which the liberation is done. I believe you may be familiar with the practice in the States where you add the diameter of the crop tree and the diameter of its neighbor, selecting only neighbors that are as tall or taller. The rest of them are not competitors. We have a table that tells you how far apart they have to be, depending on the sum diameters. It's a simple basilary relationship taken from plantations, and it works, and the trees accelerate. And the men learn it. They can't even read hardly. They learn it by heart. They know which trees are in, which are out. They poison them, go on, and the forest grows. This is something that could be done everywhere, and it's far, far cheaper than planting. And the trees you bring up are the ones that were bought there by nature. You have much higher diversity, and any tree that does not interfere with one of the ones you like, you leave it. That gives you maximum uh, fallback in the event that in the future a new market should develop or something you didn't foresee, or if the diversity is necessary for the bird life or the insects that pollinate or uh, carry the seeds. So you have that diversity there. The practice we follow is to set out plots of 20 by 20 meters. We will not allow more than there are 10 crop trees selected within the plot. We won't allow more than four of one species, purely to spare diversity. If you're in an area that's almost pure, you will purify it if you don't uh, do this. This allows other species to stay in the mix. We'll allow some forester in the future to make the tough decisions between the better species. And that's as it should be. Plantations in the tropics have come in for a lot of complaint. I'd like to say a few things about Jari in Brazil. It's one that has had a lot of notoriety. I had a rare experience to give you an idea of the tempo in which Jari came about. I was on a plane going from Fortaleza to Belém in Brazil on my way to a meeting in Trinidad, coming north. And I was furiously writing a paper I had to present in a little cramped area in the plane. A man was sitting beside me, said nothing, until we started to come down in Belém. He said, sir, excuse me, but I couldn't help but see what you're doing. Are you a forester? And I said, yes. He said, are you a tropical forester? And I said, yes. And he said, well, could I have two or three days of your time here in Belém? I'll pay you anything you want. And I said, well, what's the problem? And he said, well, my name is Orcutt. I'm a vice president of National Bulk Carriers. Uh, my boss bought the Liberty ships and he got enough fuel in them to pay back the price he paid. And we started a big um, shipping industry around the world, um, Daniel Ludwig. And we make a lot of money. And about every six months, he calls in one of the vice presidents. And he gives him a job that do and backs him financially. And two years ago, he told me to conquer the Amazon. 
And I went around the world looking for a tree, and I found it in South China. And I found seed in, in Sierra Leone. I bought seven tons of seed. He went to, he got a um, Portuguese land grant. He couldn't get land from Brazil as an outsider except through the grants. He found a grant that's about the size of Connecticut, and he got it. And we put in an airport, we put in a port, and I put in a nursery, and I planted the trees. And I planted a lot of the trees right along the airport, and they're up this high, and they're yellow. And the boss is coming in two months, and I want those trees green. And so this was the job. And I said, well, I've got to go on to Trinidad, but I think I know somebody can help you. He's back in, in Belo Horizonte in Brazil. He went back there and got this man. And the man said, well, your tractors have, contract, have, have uh, so compacted the soil that the poor things can't get down and get anything to eat, and they're starving. He said, but how do you make them green? So well, that's easy. You just get chelates, the, the way the florists green up the plants. And you spray all these leaves, and they'll go green, and they'll stay a while, and your boss will leave, and you'll be all right then. And that's exactly what they did. Well, the point is, this is the degree of impetuosity that characterized Jari. Jari began because they wanted veneer wood. And they brought this wood, this species, Melina, which produces excellent veneer. And Ludwig was 88 years old and very impatient. He wanted to see the product. And I had a friend in US plywood who lunched with him some. And he kept saying, I want you to go down there and bring back some of that wood. I want to see it made into veneer. And Bruce knew that the trees were only four or five inches in diameter at the time. They didn't have much heartwood. And he kept begging off, trying to stop it. And finally, one day, Ludwig said, I'm going to buy you out. I'll buy you as plywood, and you'll have to go down there. And so he did go down, and he brought back some wood. And he made some knickknacks <coughs> at the old man's desk. And then it was worse, because they were beautiful, and it looked like, well, why don't we get going? Well, they slowed him up when they found out that most of the wood would not make veneer because the trees weren't big enough. So they switched to paper. And they brought the mill from Japan. We all know that story. They floated it in. They made the Japanese, built the mill, was done for the first time. Ludwig used money from the banks. All the rest of it was his own money. And he bought this mill with New York bank money. And they had all the measurements. They brought in piling, drove them exactly to the measurements, bedammed up the river, floated it in, settled it on the piling, and it was on stream within about a month with Japanese labor there. And so much of this material has gone into pulpwood. Ludwig sold out later, and it's now in Brazilian hands. They're still planting about 10,000 hectares a year and putting in a separate second mill so that Things have gone fairly well from that standpoint. But a word or two on the environmental side of it. Originally, when I first went there, they were bragging because they'd lost only one man for every 2,500 hectares they planted. And I asked them, well, how'd you lose these people? And they said, well, there's two, two ways. You can't fell the Amazon forest like you do other forests. Everything's tied up with vines. So the men go in, they notch several hectares, all on the same side. Then they knock one down into it, and all the rest of them go. Well, this is fine as long as there's no wind and as long as there are no hollow ones. But if they hit a hollow one and it goes down and the men are in there, they can't get out. And everything's tied together and it all comes down and we lose somebody. The other thing is, when they get all through, three months later, they set fire to it, about 3,000 hectares at a time. And they run all through it with torches in order to produce high convection, because the logs are that big, and they have to burn them all up. And so um, men sometimes get trapped and never heard of again in the, in the fires. Well, this is history. They're not doing that anymore. The, the, the logs are all going into firing up the mill. They're using a wood fuel for the mill. One of the things that put an end to uh, Ludwig's interest was a request by Brazil that he use their power. When he got the grant, he had a whole river system in which he had a dam site. And the minute he had cut enough 
natural forest around uh, to supply his mill, he wasn't going to cut any more new forest, and he wasn't going to burn plantations. So he had to have another source of power, and he was going to put a dam on the river. Well, before he did that, uh, Electro Norte, this big corporation of Brazil, put a dam on the Tocantins downstream. And it was a huge project. Uh, the, the lake is 200 kilometers long, and they didn't have enough consumption. And so they insisted that he use that power. And it would have required a cable 26 kilometers along under the river, and he refused to do it. This was one of the, the breaking points in that project. But technically, they're in pretty good shape. Ludwig understood that Melina was what he needed. And his third forester, he fired four of them, his third forester was from Indonesia. And he knew Pinus Mercusii. And he had seed brought in and he planted it because they were planting Melina on sand and it doesn't do well on sand. And one day when the pines were up about like this, he stopped Ludwig and showed it to him. Ludwig fired him on the site. He said, the world is full of pine. We don't need it. We want Melina. Didn't tell you to bring any pine. So the guy left. Well, his successor was a former subordinate of mine. And every time they drove by that site, well, he just kept on going because he knew this was no place to stop. But the pine went up and got pretty big. And finally, Ludwig stopped him one time going by there and said, tell me about this. And he said, well, I understood you didn't like it. He said, well, um, it looks pretty good. What's, what is there to it? He said, well, this is much better for your mill than the Malina, and it's much better on the sands. The first w year we ran the mill, we cut three years of plantations because they were so poor on the sand. And we have to go way back in the mountains to get, uh, to get clay for the, for the other species. So he finally allowed 20% of pine. And then they went on and they've, they've shifted into pine a great deal. They have teak now and 12 species they're planting, which is uh, a change. <coughs> Another rather interesting anecdote about uh, Ludwig was that he used this project as therapy. He lived in New York. He had a lot of programs going. He was reputed to worth, be worth two billion at the time. And he came down in clothes of a fisherman, kind of. He looked like a bum. And he showed up at the airport in Belém, where they had the DC-3 that flew twice a day into the uh, camp. And they all knew him, the pilots all knew him, so he just climbed aboard and went there. And one day, he was the only one. And when he got there, he asked the pilot to fly around so he could look at the plantations. And looking down, he saw a long line of trees that were yellow. And he asked the pilot, well, what do you think's wrong down there? The pilot said, well, probably bad soil or something. He didn't know, of course. They landed, nothing was said. And about three months later, one morning, there was a ship loaded with fertilizer at the port. And nobody knew what it was for. And they had a hotline in New York, and they called. And he said, well, he was fortunate. He had it, it was on the high seas, headed for Japan. He turned it around, because he saw they had that yellow stuff, and they had to fertilize. This is the kind of decisions that come as to whether you use fertilizer or not under these circumstances. One of his statements is, if I don't do a lot, I can't afford to spend more on it. This is the kind of thinking that goes into this. Well, the fertilizer was in jute, not in plastic. And they had no place to store it. In that climate, you can't put it outdoors. So they tied up the ship and demurrage for months while they built a, uh, a warehouse to put it in. And somebody went out and looked at those trees. And if you know anything about big rivers, you know they form a lot of bars. And the bars all are an inch or two, one higher than the other. So this was a bar that was a little higher than its neighbors, and the species is facultatively deciduous. That is, when you get a dry spell, it goes out of leaf. And of course, it starts on the highest lands, and that's all he saw. And they never fertilized it, of course. They used it for food and other purposes. But this was the kind of thing he was not going to fail. And he, he threw out foresters one after the other for being too conservative. And the last one, I was with him here in Mexico last week, um, stayed till the very end. And I think technically, Jari is a success in many ways. One of the Brazilian uh, women who runs Sudam, the big program at, uh, at, out of Belém, 
made this statement that Ludwig had obeyed every law of Brazil in what he did. They carefully studied the laws, they bought local materials, they exported the product which they had to do. And they had found so much productivity on the lands that they used that three thousandths of one percent of the, of the Amazon basin would satiate the needs of Brazil and the rest of it could be saved for environment. That isn't what's going to happen, but this is the balance that you see. Now, it was monoculture, still is. One, uh, their ecologists question rightfully, how long can you go on taking off at the rate they're taking? And there's a limit, and I think they're aware of it. They've been monitoring the soil. The pine will go farther than the malina. It's not as heavy a feeder, and it's in sand. And the pine, they expect to get four or five crops before they have any problems with nutrients. Malina, two or three, they're not sure. They haven't got this far yet. But they have people out there monitoring. They have a whole system of soil probes they're following continuously. And of course, they know what they're taking off. And genetically, they're improving the trees. One of the striking things I saw there, whenever they found a malina that outdid its neighbors, they cut it. And then it sprouted. And they took the sprout material, which was much easier to root, and they got lots and lots of sprouts. And then they developed clones from that. Well, plantations in, in the tropics have been at best, tremendous successes, and at worst, tremendous failures. And the failures outnumber the successes about 50 to 1. People don't talk about them very much. Uh, many of them are very expensive. We planted 2,000 acres of cedrella before we abandoned it. We planted a lot of mahogany before we abandoned it, but then it came back, and we succeeded finally on that. Um, but some of you may wonder about sustainability, because we're all asking questions about sustainability. And I was told today that what I saw out the window from the car around here was not sustainable. I was surprised a little bit, but um, I realized we're putting a, a very a strong um, definition on this word, and nobody's lived long enough to see whether sustainability is really sustainable. Well, the promise of sustainability on the, in the tropics, in many views, is less than the temperate zone because of leaching, because of loss of nutrients. And this is probably true. I think it's going to be true in the temperate zone, too. We've gone a long way with forestry without much fertilizer in the temperate zone. And foresters who go to the tropics all get their training practically in the temperate zone. They don't think of fertilizer. They just go right ahead. And you get away with it for a while. But I have a suspicion that it's going to pay when the time comes. And the, what's going to have to be added may well not be primarily nitrogen. And if it's not, it may not be terribly expensive. And we may find that with a mix of species, we can do pretty well for a long time. But that is not, nobody's certain about it. I was in Malaysia not so long ago where a, a fellow from Denmark challenged the forest, the forestry they were bragging about in Sarawak. Is, is it sustainable? And he said, what about yours? And it brought down the house. Everybody knew that we were talking about something we don't know about, but we should be concerned about it. I have a few slides illustrate some of the things and I'd be wide open for comment questions when it's over. Somebody press, press the button on that. <coughs> Not all the tropical forests are broadleaf trees and steeped in water, ferns, that we're so, so accustomed to seeing. This is Pinus occidentalis in the mountains in Haiti. Sad to say this forest is no longer there for reasons I guess most of us know. The, ha the Haitian forests are down to about 1% of the land. This was one area that didn't get burned, and the pine really wanted to come back. This is around 5,000 feet elevation. They have light snows even there. This is Quercus in Central America, in, in Costa Rica. It's oak, beautiful big oaks along the Pan American Highway. If you go there now, you won't see them. It was taken some time ago. This was a tract promised by the president of 
Costa Rica as a refuge or a reserve and it turned out to have 10 hectares and somehow got cut later and is no longer there. But the, the oaks of, of the, the Costa Rican mountains are really beautiful. They're bigger than some of ours. This is in Peru, eastern Peru, wet forest. Gives you some idea of the mixture. Forest is not uniform. There are places you can ride a bicycle through it. There are places that are terribly dense. Um, the volumes are not as high as they are in the temperate zone, merely because it's a mass of gaps with trees coming up through several age classes mixed. <coughs> This is Amazon. One of the things about the forest that's impressive here is the straightness of the trees. They appear to have been struggling for light, and they go right straight up when they get a chance. And many of them that are thin, uh, don't get very large, still are extremely straight. This is a felling scene in Malaysia, a dipter carp. Uh, a, a chainsaw and you can see the low stump they're cutting. This is typical debris in the Philippines after logging. Uh, the uh, branch in the foreground is left and uh, it, there's a hole caused by the canopy but you can see straight stems in the background which are one of the things I talk about which I believe is the future forest much more so than uh, cutting it and planting. Skid trails are unpopular with people concerned about the environment. This left this way will be a, a gully, probably forever. Uh, it's cut down deep, and obviously it's in a rainy area, and you have a slide on the lower side, which uh, tends to weaken it and produce uh, more erosion. This is the beginning of the next stage where farmers have moved in and started to cut down everything that was left in order to convert it to, for agriculture. This is a railroad which you can ride on. It's a little bumpy. Um, it is used to take logs out of the swamp forests in Malaysia. The ground is too soft for uh, other vehicles and so this, you can see how much wood was used to build the railroad and the logs come to the railroad pushed by man over roads that are made of these logs uh, and greased. And so almost all of the leftover pole stock is cut just purely in getting the logs out. This is along a skid road showing removal of bark. One of the first things that's done in some species because insects get into the bark and ambrosia and other beetles work out the, saw, uh, the sapwood and reduce the value of the timber very quickly. This is in uh, Mexico, where Patricia comes from, in uh, Quintana Roo. Uh, this is the second cut in a stand uh, in southeastern Yucatan Peninsula of mahogany and Spanish cedar and chaca, which is bursera, woods that are used for veneer. The logs are not particularly straight. Some of these are culls that were left from the first cut, but the values have gone up, and so they're taking them. There's some regeneration of these species left in the forest. This is being done by an ejido, one of the communes in Mexico, which has been worked with by the German foresters for many years and has developed a management plans. They have their own equipment, and they're as close to sustained <coughs> yield as anybody in this hemisphere. These are logs waiting for, of all things, veneer. Uh, the wood is extremely valuable, used for um, uh, doweling, uh, shipped all over the world, and it's in Malaysia. And even logs with those large um, rotten centers are placed on the lathe and veneer is taken from them. This is Greenheart in uh, Guyana wood used for piling, brought out in long lengths for driving in ports because it resists uh, Toritos, marine borers. A, a uh, bandsaw, 
uh, in Malaysia. This is in Java, squaring up teak. Uh, those chips are not wasted, but the teak itself is squared before it's used for other purposes. Familiar scene in all of the areas of the Far East where logs are produced and exported in log form. This is North Borneo, and the, the, the ship is headed for Singapore and Japan. The mangroves are extensive in, in Malaysia, and they're converted to chips here by Japanese, who ship the chips to Japan, make alpha cellulose and other products there. It's a big business. The chips, of course, have salt in them. They have to be leached before they're used. This is logged out hill forest in the dipterkarps. Uh, some 30, 30 cubic meters per hectare were taken out of here, which is a heavy cut. And it's steep country. What you see is a skid trail. It's been left now. It's been about a year since it was cut. And the remarkable thing is how good the forest is. Almost everywhere there's a, a closed canopy, or nearly so. This is a condition that forests are generally left in because only certain trees are taken. Here more than most places, they did a very good job of, of skidding out without leaving uh, a whole lot of damage. And if it's not cultivated, one might ask, well, why can't this go on and make another crop? In this forest, the number one species are 174. Number two and number three, which add on.